Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be the moderator of the Outstanding Business Panel's discussion, and it gives me great pleasure to be introducing to you this morning three young and dynamic entrepreneurs from three very different industry segments who are very much at the top of their game. They are Mr. Leon Yakumic, Group Managing Director of Lasavit Hong Kong Limited, Ms. Karen Chan, Vice President Marketing and Project Development of German Pool Hong Kong Limited, and Mr. Yat Siu, Founder and CEO of Outblaze Limited. Please join me in just formally welcoming them. Each of them will be um, sharing with us their winning strategies for their uh, businesses and how Hong Kong's unique advantages have contributed to the success of their companies. So as we uh, do have a very tight program, I will not waste any more time, but uh, quickly uh, invite our first speaker, Mr. Um, Leon Yakumic, to address us first, and I'll give him uh, just a very quick introduction. Leon is uh, from Czechoslovakia and founded Lasavit in 2007 in Hong Kong. And within five short years, transformed this company into a global award-winning designer and manufacturer of lighting art installations and glass sculptures. His company now has something like 500 staff and 10 offices worldwide. And the company's work can be found in some of the world's most significant buildings, such as the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Hong Kong and the Capitol Gate in Dubai, the world's most leaning skyscraper. So I'm sure you look forward to hearing from him this morning about his thoughts and experience on choosing Hong Kong's strengths as an international platform for his products. In fact, Hong Kong is now the company's global headquarters for all of his work and products. And also, he will be sharing with us his um, views about the high-end creative industry in Hong Kong. So, Leon, please. Good morning. Today, I will share a story of last week, of which Hong Kong is a very significant part. I found it uh, last week in Hong Kong in 2007, and uh, it's now the company's global headquarters and uh, also the holding company, which owns 10 subsidiaries worldwide as far as Sao Paulo, uh, New York, Los Angeles, Milan, London, and uh, Dubai, Singapore, many other and the other offices. Uh, my presentation is, uh, will be very visual, given the nature of our products, which is design, uh, art, and uh, manufacturing. Uh, what I would like to uh, show you is, uh, is basically how a Czech company with a glass tradition and crystal background, uh, founded by my father, uh, has joined with Hong Kong, with the, with the brains, with the, with the professional uh, you know, marketing and salespeople, and also now with a factory in Shanghai where we manufacture our stainless steel and metal components, how this synergy between the traditional Europe, Hong Kong, and actually China uh, is really helping us in uh, doing our business uh, worldwide. So what does Lasvid do? Uh, we do bespoke luxury glass art installations. Uh, maybe some of you will understand more if, it's, if I mention decorative lighting, contemporary chandeliers, and so on. And uh, if, if somebody asks me in two words, how do I define La Suite? I would say bohemian perfection. It sounds contradictory. How can you be bohemian and perfect at the same time and vice versa? Uh, well, we like this because uh, we have lots of unconventional people. You should see some of our designers and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, they would not wear a tie, definitely a tie, and they are very creative. And then we have some people who are very professional, who are, who, who are obsessed with precision and professionalism. So uh, combining these two kind of people in one company is very challenging, but 
it's what makes us different. So, as I mentioned, the presentation will be quite visual, so allow me to uh, first uh, play a short video, which, uh, which I will not play the full video, of course, just uh, one and a half minutes. It shows our exhibition in Milan earlier this year. I like, the, I like the song very much, by the way. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the pandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening. Rasfit is based in the Czech Republic, and we are one of the world's leaders in custom made glass art installations. Uh, modern chandeliers, contemporary glass sculptures, and so on. At one point, we felt, let's do something different. Let's do something that hasn't been done yet. We thought of several designers, and Fabio Novembre uh, is a good friend of mine, and uh, then Fabio brought in uh, two more designers. Okay, uh, Nendo, from Japan, and Matthew Lehaner from uh, France. We are Bohemians, we are from Bohemia, which is the western part of Czech Republic. So Bohemian Rhapsody was kind of a natural topic. Easy come. Ho pensato a questo brano di, dei Queen che mi ha sempre appassionato moltissimo, è Bohemian Rhapsody, no? Però ho, ho cercato veramente di materializzare. So, I wish we had time for the full movie, I'm sure you would enjoy it, but uh, uh, we, we are more interested in answering your questions. So, let me proceed and show you the first uh, and one of my favorite projects that we have done in Hong Kong earlier this year, the Ritz Carlton Hong Kong. Uh, it's the tallest hotel in the world. We did uh, most of the public areas. We, we have very good relationship with uh, San Hong Kei, the, the very famous Hong Kong developer. And uh, we have been working on many of their project, projects in Asia Pacific and uh, China and elsewhere. So I'll just uh, show you some of the areas. This is the Chinese restaurant. Uh, Princess Building is another interesting project that uh, I have enjoyed uh, overseeing. In China, with the Shangri-La group, uh, we do a lot of projects. So again, we work with many Hong Kong developers, uh, actually on projects uh, all over Asia. So this is, for example, the China World Summit Wing, the, uh, the tallest building in Beijing. Fairmont, Beijing. Uh, in addition to hotels, we do also shopping malls. So this is another uh, this is the most luxury shopping mall in China, the IFC Mall in Pudong. And each of our pieces, they always have a story. So this piece was inspired by the life in the universe, for example. We don't sell just products. We, we, we like to sell, um, uh, we sell art, and uh, each art piece has a certain story behind. Another project inspired by uh, fluidity. In Macau, it's the city of dreams. Six meter by six meter, uh, sea anemone. This is the only Shangri-La in Japan, the Shangri-La Tokyo. We have done about 20 Tiffany stores worldwide, all the flagship uh, stores. This is the one in Taipei. Project in India. I have just picked one example from you know, different uh, parts of Asia Pacific, plus, uh, for example, uh, projects later, you will see projects from outside as well, from Middle East and US. This is the Marina Bay Sands, Singapore, project in Indonesia. This is a metro. I, I, I hope one day we can do something for the MTR, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem likely yet. Hopefully in a few more years. Some examples of projects in Europe. This is the Savoy in London. This was the Four Seasons Park Lane. This is Philippe Stark, famous French designer. We did a project in Miami. In addition to big, large installations, we also do trophies for famous celebrities. So this was the, for Tour de France. We did the trophy for this year for the winner and all the other three uh, winners under 25 years old and so on. 
you probably uh, the Masters just finished the Masters tournament in London uh, with Roger Federer winning the tournament. This was uh, earlier. This was last year's Muba de la World Tennis Championships. Uh, Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal won our trophies. We are sponsoring this tournament this year again. We also do a lot of uh, trade fairs. So these are some examples I picked. This is from the 100% Design London. from France, and we also sell collections for homes. So we don't only do hotels, we also do residential properties, uh, small houses, I mean, actually large houses, not small houses. <laughs> and we have uh, glass sculptures and other collectibles. The latest product is the crystal wall, which is, a, which is the only wall that unites. Now, how is this is made? This, uh, this building is our glass factory in Czech Republic. It may seem like a, like a bakery, but actually it's a glass factory. And uh, inside we have 65 you know, glass blowers who have learned from their fathers and grandfathers. They, they are not ordinary glass blowers, they are more artists, they are artisans. There are some images from the production. So, this was the little background of, uh, of last week, and now why Hong Kong? And uh, why is Hong Kong so significant for us? So obviously Hong Kong is significant for us because we have the global headquarters here. So everything we run uh, globally is now run from Hong Kong, where I, I have been living for the last 12 years. Uh, it's also our sales and market headquarters for Asia Pacific, from where we generate uh, more than 30% of our revenues. Uh, we have Lane Crawford as our retail agent in Hong Kong since uh, 2010. And by now, we sell to most uh, Hong Kong developers to their proper properties uh, basically worldwide. Uh, this year, we also did uh, this little unique thing, the Ambassador's Ball. Maybe some of you have heard about. It was a charity event to support the Hong Kong design community. We donated a very unique uh, trophy, and uh, it was uh, the top prize of the whole, uh, whole, whole event. So why Hong Kong? Uh, I think we will all agree that geography must be the number one reason because uh, it's just a perfect location here. Uh, it's four hours flight to Tokyo, it's two hours to Shanghai, it's close to China, uh, for close to Beijing, four hours to Singapore, Indonesia. It's, it's a really great location and uh, if you ask ten people, eight, eight of them I think will tell you it's the, it's the best location if you want to do business in Asia Pacific. Uh, second reason to, uh, we chose Hong Kong are the people here. The people. I think Jim mentioned here earlier today that uh, they are very flexible, and I agree. Uh, the people in Hong Kong are just much more flexible. I don't want to say anything bad about uh, Chinese, mainland Chinese, but uh, definitely uh, compared to Shanghai, Hong Kong people are much more flexible. And uh, we as a European company, we like uh, the leaders, the bosses in our company. We like to be and we are challenged by our stuff, which doesn't happen in mainland China um, here. My staff, they actually challenge us, and that's, that's a great thing, because then the company can really develop and uh, have more ideas and be more, more flexible. So ease of establishing, well, uh, setting up a business in Hong Kong is probably as difficult, as easy, I would say as easy as in Singapore, and definitely much, much easier than, than Shanghai. Basically, I would like to compare Singapore and Shanghai you know, to, uh, to Hong Kong in, uh, in this part of my, of my presentation. Um, Client-wise, if you are in this luxury business or hotel development business or anything related to, to high-value-added high products, the Hong Kong is the place. There are the most developers in Asia. Uh, there are the most architects and designers in Asia Pacific. For us, it's just the perfect, uh, perfect location, better than Hong Kong, uh, better than Singapore, Shanghai. And uh, well, by entertainment and restaurants, I don't just mean uh, Lang Kwai Fong. Uh, I, I think. Uh, Hong Kong just has uh, amazing food, and uh, it's, uh, it's really a great place to be. I personally like hiking, so countryside for me. When I came to Hong Kong, I thought it was just concrete jungle. Uh, by now, I have uh, been to many parts of the new territories, to Tai Lung Wah, and uh, I think some of these beaches there are as nice as in Thailand. So uh, I was very impressed, and I think all these points together make Hong Kong really, uh, for us, you know, a great place. When we say positive things, we should mention maybe two negative things. is the air quality. I hope that this will improve in the near future. And finally, as I learned earlier today, with the cultural new district, I think the, 
the, the relative lack of cultural events will also improve uh, because obviously being from Prague originally we have uh, the highest number of theaters per person in the world in Prague. Hong Kong is definitely doesn't have uh, so many concerts and uh, interesting performances so I think that uh, now is the best cultural district which I just learned was, will finish in, by 2016. This should improve a lot as well. Uh, so basically Hong Kong is the winner out of Shanghai and uh, out of all the other parts of Asia Pacific and uh, I think last week is very grateful to Hong Kong and uh, I, I'm not afraid to say that if it was not for Hong Kong, we, last week would not be where it is right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Leon. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Karen Chan, Vice President, Marketing and Development of German Pool Hong Kong Limited. Uh, founded in 1982, German Pool specializes in the manufacturing, wholesaling, and retailing premium electrical appliances, kitchen cabinetry, and kitchen equipment, and is one of the most influential players in these two industry segments in both Hong Kong and mainland China. Having worked elsewhere in the US, in Canada, and as well as Hong Kong for over 10 years, Karen returned to work for the family business in 2006 and is responsible for planning the company's overall project development and devising the group's marketing and branding strategy. She also serves on a number of public committees um, and is very devoted to her community work and for instance, she is the chairman of the Hong Kong Quality Brand Alliance. And she was awarded the Young Industrialist Award of Hong Kong by the Federation of Hong Kong Industries in 2009. She also studies a lot. She believes in lifelong learning. So I just do not know where she finds the time to accommodate all these very challenging aspects of her life. So, um, Karen, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for um, the introduction. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be here with all of you today. Um, to just add a few points to uh, my background, um, I am a um, mother of a uh, one and a half year old. Um, I'm still working on my DBA degree on top of my two masters and two bachelor's degrees that I have earned throughout my whole life. I spent uh, one third of my time in uh, North America, um, live, work, study, there, I enjoy so much living in North America, including San Francisco, Seattle, and New York, as well as Vancouver. Love it. Um, I'm, um, a, um, I'm the eldest kid in my family. Um, my father founded the company actually in 1982, not 1992. Um, he founded the company 30 years ago um, as a, a small and uh, medium enterprise. Most of the companies in Hong Kong, actually 90% of us are SMEs to begin with. And we are still consider ourselves as SMEs. Um, so my assignment after I spent uh, a great time in North America, get a call from my father one day, it's about time for you to serve. So I come back. So he gave me a, a very glamorous role as a uh, VP in marketing and project development. Um, in a Chinese word, I call it as a, it's like the uh, lowest servant in the company. Because I've got to do every single thing in the company. Um, but it's fun, actually, it's very challenging. Um, I started out um, helping the marketing uh, campaign for the whole company. As uh, you can see, a company name is German Pool. But we are founded in Hong Kong. Very interesting. 
A little bit um, explanation to our name. German Poo stands for German-made quality products. Poo means group of great products. Of course, back in 30 years ago, we only carry one single type of product, which is water heater. Back then, my father loved German-made products, and he believed German stands for good quality. And since we, um, create, we are actually importing goods from German and we use the OBM strategy, we actually work with um, original brand manufacturer across in the overseas in Germany and we build our own brand name. So we partner with real German company, real German manufacturer and create our own water heater. Pool stands for a pool of um, hot water. But now there is some new meanings to it. What I wanted to do and what I wanted to help my father to continue his mission is to really bring all international goods from all over the world that makes our company a pool of quality products. Um, for the past six years, uh, we are lucky and very um, proud that uh, we gain uh, quite a few um, awards. Um, we are uh, one of the top brands and super brands in Hong Kong and um, we are very privileged to be part of the um, quality mark program as well. So we have been working very hard in the past um, six years uh, after I am on board to have the company to try make it not a local company but try to make German pool a household brand name. So for the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to do is to share with you what I have done. Um, as a uh, student in marketing, a lifelong student in uh, marketing, I believe this seven piece is a very helpful guidelines that help me make every single um, decision in the company I'm working with now. First of all, is, um, I just show you how we uh, grow. First off, we build water heater. And then after 10 solid years, we build a great uh, reputation, reputation um, a brand name. In the providing good quality water heater, we move into a diversified portfolio, including all kinds of household and kitchen appliances. In 2002, we branch out in the providing one-stop shop kitchen services, including kitchen cabinetry, as well as all the kitchen appliances in the kitchen. Then I come back, of course, all oh, the daughter doesn't like what um, the father's choice. So I've got to bring in something new. I love designer products. So we upgrade the whole thing and we brought in professional and designer series on top of to the basic household appliances that we have. And about three years ago, we also launched another product line. It's a um, far infrared healthcare products. So now we have a, uh, more than 30 categories of home appliances under one brand name, German Pool. And uh, it's too confusing to have so many categories. So we group it into three big areas, home appliances, kitchen appliances, and kitchen cabinetry. In terms of cabinetry, again, it's a bit confusing if you have local China-made cabinetry versus if you are going to do the high-end market, we're bringing in the overseas German-made, 100% made and designed in Germany products. So how do we differentiate ourselves? So the local German pool cabinetry this is a real photo that is uh, from our Tokwa One flagship showroom. This is another showroom we have in Sha Tin, another one in um, uh, Wan Chai. So what to do with a import brand? We would not just go for branding and other company's brand because we are a brand builder. We want to only have our brand in the market. But how to distinguish ourselves with the local made made in China, German pool kitchen, versus the made in Germany, German pool kitchen. So that's what we're going to do. 
we are actually having a co-brand strategy. Whatever is made in Germany, we will co-brand it. Instead of just saying German pool made in Germany, it's pretty hard sell. So we actually put our exclusive partners name with us, German pool by Ballerina Kitchen. That's how we're going to differentiate ourselves with the mid-market to the high-end market. And um, with the products, we are, go we are actually upgrading the whole series with a more high-end, more luxurious style, more designer-oriented style. Those are a few sam samples. And they are all going to be under German pool by Ballerina. They have very special elements. They have the Swarovski crystal on the handles. And um, they have the, uh, the best of the best um, designers all across uh, the world, um, architects, designers, to design the glass panel of our kitchen. And they have a signature on the glass panel. Many different accessories, which uh, the local make kitchen doesn't come with. So we are very happy partners with them. There are lots of car case colors, lots of handles to choose from. The other big bread and butter is our water heater business. Remember back in day, um, day one, we started out as a water heater manufacturer yet, um, and a brand um, um, water heater brand. We also do similar thing like the German pool by Ballerina Kitchen. We manufacture the lower end storage type water heater. But what we import from Germany, we call brand. We call brand with an exclusive partner in Germany called Klagi. So German pool by Klagi is the high end model that's helped our customers to distinguish which is the high end ones and which is a more lower end one. We don't want people to think we are the fake German brand. We are who we are. We are from Hong Kong. We bring in the best of the best products all around the world. And we have local made China goods that we are very proud of. But we have different customers. They may need more, they may need uh, more high end products. So we bring in other better brands in terms of the quality. And um, because of the technology in Germany is always the best in water heater. So we do this. And uh, we've been in uh, different projects in Shanghai, in uh, Guangdong. Um, those are the products that they use our products. Okay, so after we have talked about product is the prime thing, the second P is price. Um, you have to know your position very well. We know we are not the LV in our industry. However, we know we can do Coach. Coach is a very solid high-end brand, but they are going to provide affordable luxury goods. So we know who we are. So we decided this is our market. We are going to go after the high end, but not too extremely expensive um, category. So we are going for the value for money, but affordable luxury. In terms of place, place is um, distribution channels. The reason we have to put all the 30 some categories of products into three major lines is because each type of product has a different channel called distribution network. For distributor, they are for the more commodity type of goods. Those, we can rely on distributor. They don't need to have a, a very fancy outlet. They just need to know your product is at a good price and a standard price. Then the, your distributor will help you distribute your goods. However, for small appliances, we call the lifestyle appliances, we have to go through the value at the retailer. For example, we have the Jusco, we have the um, Guomei, we have um, Wing On, we have Uni, we have Sogo. Those are the value at the retailer. They help us, give us the space, and we have to build a very beautiful consignment a booth to show directly how our products is, um, is the best. For example, we have small appliances like Pro um, Processor. It's a um, food processor. 
Compared to a juicer or mixer, it is about 10 times more expensive than a juicer. But why the customer has to buy? Because this is a more powerful fruit processor, but without demonstration, we are not going to be, um, to be able to sell to the customer. So we are re uh, rely a lot on the value at the retailer, providing us the overall marketing support and the space for us to show the customer why our products worth that money. Then uh, we also have a showroom, like what I have shown you before, the three different uh, strategic locations, providing one-stop shop kitchen services, including kitchen and appliances. We only have three showrooms. We call strategic showroom because Hong Kong is not a very big um, place, as we all know. We strate uh, strategically choose Hong Kong, New Territories, and Carlo, one um, store in one big area. That's actually helped us to support the distributors because most distributors or value added retailer, they don't have much space. For a company like us with a long product line, they will be able to sh maybe showcase one or two of your key products. So our showroom act as a showroom for them, for the end users. The showroom actually act as a B2B platform to help our retailers and uh, our distributors, so that the end users, when they want to see a complete full line, they come to a showroom. And in a showroom, we always price the highest price, because we are not going to compete with our value-added retailers or distributors. After we talk about product, price, place, the main part of what people know about marketing most likely is in promotion. We do a lot um, in promotion. We um, actually have a 360 degree program of promotion that we did. Um, but then, before that, we need good people. We need people to help think the strategy. Because why Hong Kong? Hong Kong is a place with seven million people. People in Hong Kong, they have international horizon. They actually um, have very good taste. They love style, they love design. Hong Kong is the best place to test out market if you ever plan to go into China. China is really big. The whole China can be divided into actually many, many small countries, in my opinion. Each province is actually like a country itself. If you want to test out market, Hong Kong is the best place because we are small, but we have all the international collection of ideas than the best of the best people in Hong Kong. So people for us is very important and we provide ongoing training for professional te um, technicians or sales or even the roadshow promoter, uh, promotion people that we have to train ongoing. Process um, is actually um, not a very um, um, clear process as part of marketing, but process is actually a very important component in terms of the whole marketing process. Day one, I come back to the office, I have to collect all the information about what my father's team has done in the past 20 some years. Um, it's very hard for a girl who get education in North America, work in North America, and coming back to work for a very local Chinese uh, family-oriented company. Um, this is the key to the whole marketing campaign. Because if you don't have a standard pricing system, you cannot move forward. Remember the first thing I show is um, product and pr second is price. If you don't have a standard price, the whole market will be in chaos. So what I have to do is to um, carry out a very standard price process and then how can I do it? Because we are a small and medium sized company, hiring a consultant is not possible. So what we do, we actually enter a, some um, program volunteer program is um, like a ISO standard. Um, this is what we do in Hong Kong. We do ISO and quality mark. We go through the process. We actually leverage on the third party audit process so that we have a way, a system for us 
to learn from because I have not much resources. I have to rely on someone's intelligence to help my company build a process. So this is what I do. I uh, spend lots of time to restructure the whole process in the company. Physical evidence. Physical evidence means, for example, packaging or the overall look and feel. That's what I do a lot too. So this is what um, the company logo looks before. And this is how it looks now. In terms of packaging, this is how it looks before. And now it's more clear, more bright, more vivid. This is how the inconsistency in terms of all the catalogs. And this is, we bring in corporate image. Before the truck, this is how it looks like. In terms of showroom, it's more a local style. And then this is how it looks like. This is how we do road show before. And this is the consistent look that we push. This is how we did um, the big exhibition booth. And this is how it looks. As I said, promotion is usually what people think of uh, marketing. We do the 360 degrees. In terms of, we find, we do a lot of soft selling through PRs. We have spokespersons. We do lots of ads, sponsorship, marketing collectors, events, and campaign. Just to give you some idea, we make use of a lot of uh, local professional magazines. And um, these are for the kitchen cabinetry market. Um, local ads penetrated in the world, um, all kinds of different magazines in Hong Kong. This is a very um, um, interesting thing I would suggest uh, for those uh, who would like to come start in Hong Kong to try the award marketing strategy. Um, getting a reputable award in Hong Kong is very important. Um, in the past six years, as you see early in my slideshow, uh, we uh, gained a handful of awards. Um, it's not something that we pay to get. In Hong Kong, you cannot do that. Uh, we have to really go through um, the whole audit process. And um, getting ourselves to put in terms of the top brands category helps a lot. And we are, a lot of occasions, we be invited by a lot of um, different organizations um, to represent Hong Kong. So if you have to create a brand with limited budget at first, try to go through this. This is really worth doing it. We do consumer choice, we do super brands. Those are the top awards that um, we manage to go through. And um, the next thing I would like to share is we do a lot of um, local presence in the um, media. Um, if you want to go to, into China, it's very important that you are seen in TV. But it's so expensive for us to launch a TV program or launch a TV campaign. So what we do, we do product placement. We do a lot of product sponsorship to line up with celebrities. We do lots of events so that we capture all the celebrities that we are covered in the TV or in magazines. We host a lot of dinner events, inviting all the celebrities so that we've been covered in the uh, news, uh, in the TV. And um, spokesperson is another thing we do. Um, this is also an important thing that we have been using. We're not always um, hiring the most expensive stars, but you have to know your position. You have to know your target audience and find the right person to speak for your company. This is the, a very famous chef in Hong Kong. We do a lot of cooking show sponsor because we want to associate our brands to very good cooks, professional cooks. Then when we remember when they are cooking, they want to think of German pool. They want to think of German pool's kitchen and German pool's appliances. So this is another supporting promotions things that we do. We sponsor a lot of TV shows because in China they are able to see most of the shows um, that we do in Hong Kong. And with product placements, placements not like ads, in China they, they actually run your program but they cut all the ads. So if you are able to put your products in a particular program, 
you're able to leverage on the airtime during their playing your program, but not cutting out all your TV ads. And we do a lot of a movie sponsorship. Again, this content will also be bought by, say, Cathay Pacific, that type of airlines, or cable TV stations. They like to buy good quality movies. So we do a lot of sponsorship and product placement in such area. Another supporting marketing materials that we do, just so you know our look and feel. And we do lots of trade shows like the upcoming one in the Victoria Park in December 10th. Um, it's very important. If you want to go into China, try to attend as many events, a trade show as possible, and pick the right one. The Hong Kong brand and um, exhibition is a very good one because it is a one month long program and the many China visitors, they love to come to Hong Kong and buy Hong Kong made goods in Hong Kong. So they come to um, the Hong Kong BPE and they see us the biggest and largest booth. They will know our brand by there and uh, they have confidence in us. It helps us to get into China a lot faster and easier when we are just starting out in China. Um, another um, important um, shows that I would like to um, share is the one that is um, supported by the trade and uh, the TDC. TDC has a very good platform um, that a company decided to go with them on every single trade show that they, have, they are going to organize in China. Um, because they select the best of the locations, which we don't have the resource to find which is a good place to start out in China, even though we are a well-known brand in Hong Kong. However, we don't know China well. But if you are one of the top brands, you have a good reputation in Hong Kong, join force with the TDC type of organizers. They pick the best um, location in China. They do tons of research and they find the best place so that we can enter the market via the intelligence. What I'm trying to do today is to make use of the resources and leverage on the partners. We actually, in terms of the coverage we have in Hong Kong, we actually didn't spend a lot of money. We actually always leverage on free publicity, free PR, or leverage on our partners who has a strong presence in the area. And TDC is uh, something that, that I would highly recommend that uh, you can uh, try if you have a trade show, if you're having a business in Hong Kong and going to China, try them. So this is uh, what I have today. And um, I will be answering more questions later on in the Q&A session. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. The final speaker that I have great pleasure in introducing is Mr. Yat Siu, founder and CEO of Outblaze, a multiple award-winning company that pioneered cloud-like provision of multilingual white-label web applications. I must confess, I have absolutely no idea what I just said <laughs> and what cloud-like provision of white label web applications are, but I am certainly very glad that Yat is here to enlighten us. His life story is also very interesting. Yat was in fact born and brought up in Austria, educated there, and he has worked in Germany, the USA, UK, and then he moved on, uh, where else, Japan and Japan, so very, very uh, an international nomad, if you like. Um, and he moved to Hong Kong in 1994 and founded Outblaze in 1998. He has won multiple awards for his work, including being named a global leader of tomorrow by the World Economic Forum in 2002, and he was declared a young global leader in 2006. Yet is going to share with us his reasons for moving to Hong Kong to set up his business, as well as give some insights into what he sees as the current state uh, of the IT industry in the region. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, uh, as said before, we are based in Hong Kong and headquartered. Outblaze um, started in a small place in Wan Chai, in Borough Street. Uh, it was sort of the equivalent of a garage outfit. Um, and today we're basically um, a pretty f a reasonably sized group with 12 different sub-companies. Um, many of them you might not know because actually our market is in Hong Kong. But the two companies of the brands you might know is we have a joint venture with Sunrio called Sunrio Digital. So if you know Hello Kitty, anything online or animations that you see on Hello Kitty, that's us. Or we have a joint venture also with Turner called Turnout Ventures, as in Turner plus Outplays. And uh, that does all the digital stuff for, you know, if you have kids and you know Ben 10, Powerpuff Girls and that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, we are a um, mostly a research and development and design house. So maybe I'll just quickly introduce it very briefly. A global operation, uh, we founded in 1998. Uh, in Hong Kong alone, we employ approximately 200 people in the cyberport. Um, we consider ourselves a pioneer in the internet space. We started this business in 98. Actually, when I came to Hong Kong, I started one of Hong Kong's first ISP called Hong Kong Online, which um, kind of tells you the fact that I could register that name, the state of the market. Um, it was a terrible failure, but that's how you learn. And then I started Outplays, which worked out a little better. And um, how about the U.S. Is, a large, uh, is the largest market. In fact, Hong Kong uh, locally represents only less than 1%, but I'll come to that later. Uh, some of the recent milestones to the question of the cloud computing lab, uh, we sold the email business, which was the core of our original business, which actually was a cloud computing lab, which uh, you may not know what it is, but basically if you are using Apple, if you're using iTunes, if you're using Amazon, everything sits on the cloud, everything's virtualized, um, you're just using the service. Uh, and in fact, uh, IBM bought that business of ours um, and actually became set up their research lab in Hong Kong through that acquisition and it became Hong Kong's, IBM's first Hong Kong lab and actually I think Hong Kong's first cloud computing lab um, and that was a few years ago. Uh, with today, um, one of our main businesses I'm focusing on my time is we're the largest app developer publisher in Asia. We have 45 million customers. Um, in fact, if you have an Android phone, um, you'll see under, under our brands uh, we have like five or six apps in the top. Uh, the number one trending app is ours. Uh, or if you have an Apple iPhone and you look at the top 25 apps, um, you'll find several apps of ours in the top ranking charts. So, so and a bunch of awards. So I'll just uh, skip that part. And so did you see the office? I mean, we don't really have a process. You see lots of computers and lots of kids working on it. So uh, our workforce is generally quite young. Um, and, um, and I'll come to that part later. Uh, and we have offices in multi-different countries. So... All right, I guess the main thing for us is we, we focus in four key areas. We're a consumer business, really, at the end of the day, whether it's B2B or B2B2C or just B2C directly. So we develop products, and it goes directly to the consumer experience. Uh, research and development is our core. Uh, more than half of our budget, uh, annual budget, goes into R&D, which basically includes uh, you know, programming, development, uh, and innovative, innovative design. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to IP technology, so things like augmented reality. Um, and we also use brands. That's why we have our joint ventures with, let's say, Sanrio or Turner to basically help promote the products as well. Um, and uh, we aim to have a fun and creative consumer experience and, of course, hope to make some money on the way too. Uh, and this is a you know, r range of some of our products, some of the brands you might recognize. Um, and, again, if you have kids, there's a high likelihood that you will have you know, your kids will have played one of our games uh, at some point or seen one of our animations and so forth. And, uh, yeah, it's Tom and Jerry, Hello Kitty, Ben 10. So. Okay, so enough about our, our business. Um, let's talk about Hong Kong, why we picked Hong Kong and what I thought were some of the key advantages. So first, I think Hong Kong is um, uh, a nice low-friction environment. And by low-friction, I don't mean that it's easy to do business, not at all. But it is a... Um, a, a quick, no-nonsense environment. So if you want to set up a business, you can do it very quickly. Uh, the tax environment is actually very beneficial, I think, as all of you know. Um, and it has uh, a very excellent support framework, whether it's legal, accounting, or so on, and that should not be underestimated, particularly in our kind of work, which relates to intellectual property 
uh, and so forth. That is an important element. And also the ability to be able to do intellectual property related work globally. In other words, meaning since our core market is actually the US uh, and actually our second largest market is the EU, um, we need to be able to support that out of Hong Kong and, and we, can, we can do that. And it's a pragmatic business environment, meaning um, you know, people want to make money, so it's pretty easy, right? Um, it's not that difficult, it's not terribly political on the business side of things. So we can move things uh, fairly quickly here. Um, and of course, from a geography, we can go everywhere very, very, very easily. The other thing is the people. So this is a fairly important part for us because our business is nothing without the people because our people make the content, create the programs. Um, you know, we don't have production plans, we don't have manufacturing, so you know, you could say our IP sits with the people. Um, <clears throat> and the, the diversity is key in our case because it's a global marketplace. Um, and frankly, we think diversity is key to any, to any success. And Hon Hong Kong is attractive to both people in and outside of Hong Kong. People in Hong Kong don't really want to leave Hong Kong most of the time, they like it here. And people who from abroad come to Hong Kong like myself and th say, hey, I think I'll be here for a couple of months and then you know, 20 years later you go, what, you know, what, what happened? And uh, I think a lot of stories in Hong Kong are about sort of people who came here short term and ended up being here long term because it has an attractive lifestyle, whether be it food or be it whatever. And um, you know, as mentioned before, pollution is an issue, but still, despite all of that, it still seems to be a magnet uh, for talent uh, and has an educated local workforce. Um, in fact, it's easier to bring someone to Hong Kong um, from overseas. So Hong Kong may not have all the talent required. Frankly, even though it's got seven million people, as compared to the world, it's still very small. But we can easily ask people from the US or from Canada or from UK or from anywhere else in the world to come move to Hong Kong for a couple of years, and that's not a problem. Ask them to do that, let's say in China, it's a little harder because English, language skills, lifestyle, food, Lan Kui Fong, whichever it is, right? People just basically have a, a, a certain preference. So, so Hong Kong does offer these choices um, and uh, is perhaps less sterile than, say, the Singapore version. Um, the other thing that's important for us, especially because of our global business, is cross-cultural awareness. Um, Hong Kong is unique in that sense because it was a former colony, of course, um, so it has a westernized history, yet it, it is very traditional in that sense too, in the sense that it has, uh, it's rooted in very Asian and Chinese values. And that creates an interesting blend for understanding. So um, you've probably heard some horror stories if you, or if you work in some organizations. Certainly when I first came to Hong Kong, one of the companies I worked with was AT&T, which is of course a big global company, but um, very Americanized, which is both good and bad. But you'd ask an American, business manager who at that point probably has never been to Asia come out and run a team in Asia with an American style and doesn't always work out very well. Uh, and it's not because they don't know what they do, it's because of the cultural awareness. Uh, it's because they maybe rub people the wrong way, it's maybe because they don't understand face or they don't understand how to communicate and that is important, uh, especially in a globalized world. And so that is an advantage for Hong Kong as well because whether it's people from overseas who have lived in Hong Kong for a long time or whether it is um, basically um, people educated locally who interact with a lot of people from abroad, there is again that kind of globalized cultural awareness that becomes a managerial advantage. So out of Hong Kong, we can have managers that know how to deal with people in our Philippine office, know how to deal with people in Korea, know how to deal with people in China or the US or the UK or generally most places around the world. Uh, we don't do anything in Africa, but perhaps even there. So, so it's, it's just um, it's, it's an easier mix uh, uh, for us. Um, <clears throat> and uh, well, I forgot to mention this, but um, maybe back to this slide here is um, also in Hong Kong, as mentioned before, is, is a great test bed. Uh, we have half a million customers here in Hong Kong, two million downloads on our apps. And the thing about Hong Kong consumers, they love to buy phones, they love to buy many phones, they love to download lots of apps and they love to play them very often. They don't pay as much as let's say counterparts in Japan or the US. In fact, they're quite, um, let's say, frugal that way to be polite about it. But the consequence of that is if you can make the product work well in Hong Kong, um, then generally speaking, there is a fairly good chance that you can succeed elsewhere. Uh, because it is, uh, the thing about low friction is to say that it's easy to set up, but the high friction part is it's incredibly competitive. Uh, and because of our business in particular, and because of the English-speaking nature, 
our competition is not just Hong Kong companies, but is actually global companies um, who are also selling products into Hong Kong in that space. And that actually means that if you succeed here, then you can succeed, generally speaking, around the world, at least in our space. Okay, so um, people is a critical asset. So, you know, there's a bunch of ingredients, but I think the main thing for us is people, um, hiring and retaining. In fact, retention is perhaps more important to us as a, as a gradient than, say, hiring. Because, so we have a less than 5% turnover rate, uh, which we're trying to continue, and that's pretty high for us already, uh, because we invest in the people. So if they leave, frankly, everything goes. And, um, and so we have to do a lot to retain them. Continued retraining is important. Um, you know, I think the general feeling uh, for, uh, and that's kind of an, uh, an issue of sort of university does not really prepare, um, I think this is universal, right, to prepare you necessarily for real work. Uh, in fact, it's just kind of you're graduating to enter the next stage in life as opposed to think you're finished. Um, and um, because half of all, over half of our budget is in research and development, everything is in, involved in training and development. Um, and the other advantage we do have in Hong Kong, maybe it's a bit more unique to us, is that we are kind of unique uh, in the sense that there's not many Hong Kong companies like us here. So while we have products which we compete with globally, we do have a niche that appeals to a certain audience. If you want to make games and you want to have a global uh, sort of a million user base to try out your games, there's not many choices for you to go to in Hong Kong. There are, of course, other companies you can go to, but it's not as big. And that does provide an advantage because we provide a unique proposition. And the point is not so much that you have to do a business that nobody else does, but rather that there might be a proposition for us anyway to retain talent that is attractive and that nobody else does. So people want to go here. So you can go choose to work for, you know, I mean, our biggest competition for, for engineering talent actually comes from uh, investment banks because they pay very well most of the time, maybe not recently. Um, and they... Uh, and, uh, and some people prefer working for a bank, but it's that talent that goes there. So um, we provide uh, those that want to join an organization, I guess, uh, because they're passionate about games, or passionate about content, or passionate about doing stuff for kids. And that, that choice is good for us because that helps us in the retention, and perhaps that could be another way in which one could try to retain key people. And in conclusion, a few things that uh, we think Hong Kong could do even better if um, um, I think Hong Kong's lifestyle is great, um, but it is still an attractive short-term place for most people. When people come to Hong Kong, especially from overseas, they don't think of Hong Kong as a base. They, some do stay very long, like myself and many of us here, but um, I think the long-term part is important because quite a few people, at least in our workforce, come here, let's say from Canada or from U.S., but they're all thinking in two or three years they want to go, right? Which is, uh, but if there's things that can be done to make it more long-term, then I think there's more opportunities for innovation because that's an investment, right? Um, education is important. Education in Hong Kong is very good um, already. Uh, many of the students also study abroad and come back. But I think one thing that is a little different is young entrepreneurship. I think um, it's already been said. I mean, most uh, you know, SMEs are very important to Hong Kong. But I think the difference, and I remember this uh, specifically, I think 13 years ago when we first started in Out uh, Outblaze, when we were trying to hire fresh grads, uh, I remember this quote where one of the, uh, uh, actually several of them said, I'd like to work here, but I've got to ask my parents. And of course, we were in a crappy one chai office, and it really didn't look like we had a, a much of a chance at the time as compared to, let's say, a job at HSBC. But the point that I was trying to make then is like, that's fine, you can always join HSBC later. The amount of money that you end up making in um, HSBC for your first job is insignificant as compared to what you would be making when you're 30 or 35. And the kind of risks or the kind of experience you would get as a young entrepreneur or starting for a startup, where frankly your experience is much broader, um, should be greater. Um, and I think that's kind of a contrast I see of Hong Kong versus you know, everyone's trying to emulate Silicon Valley in our space anyway, but the difference about Silicon Valley is that everyone thinks it's cool to be in a startup or to do a startup right from college, whereas in Hong Kong, frankly, a lot of people end up working for a corporation. And by the time you hit 30, and you have a child, and you stop, have a mortgage, and you have a down payment, or you have to, those responsibilities, your ability to take risk is slightly different. So I think if, but, but if Hong Kong has, let's say, more encouragement in, in joining smaller companies where you have a more diverse role, uh, I think it would, uh, it would definitely provide maybe an even bigger innovation spark in Hong Kong. Um, 
And I think the other one is more development in individuals as a rule um, or as a philosophy. There's a lot of, there's some, you know, Hong Kong does great jobs and promotional budgets, sending people abroad. But I actually think also if there's some training and personal development grants that are substantial, um, as opposed to equipment or development loans in that sense, it would help because people investing, especially for service economy, is um, at least in our view very important. So I think those are some of the things that can help create corporate diversity and make Hong Kong an even better place than it already is. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Yet, for that uh, presentation. Um, that concludes all the three presentations, and uh, we now come to the uh, questions uh, session. Um, you can either put your questions down on paper, and these will be brought to us here, or you could um, just um, ask your question from the floor. If I could ask the first question, uh, which is for uh, Yat. Japan, like the USA or Europe, is undergoing economic difficulty. Uh, young people may lose their energy. But do you think Japan's creativity, like Sanrio and designs in general, will further develop? If yes, why? So, so uh, we... Hello? Okay, so we... Um... Actually, uh, we started our business in 98. And in fact, that was just kind of at the tail end of the Asian economic crisis. And uh, it was actually, and then actually the next time where we grew the fastest was actually in 2003 during SARS. So this is something people kind of go, well, that's kind of strange, why is that? Um, because actually in adversity, there's a lot more opportunity. And so to the question of creativity, I think that even though it's very tragic what's going on in Japan and the global economy, because there's a lot of things that are being shaken up from the core, because there's so much change, and because there's so much adversity, there is a lot more opportunity for something new, for something creative, for something diverse. And um, you know, it's funny that people talk about Japan in a creative way, because actually its education system and its general system in place is actually not very much encouraging innovation. But they have lots of mass, lots of people, and good education, so the percentile of success that comes out still is quite low, but as compared to the US, as a ratio, is still lower. But I think, um, anyway, in conclusion, I think um, one, should not, uh, anyway, one should not look at these problems as you know, sitting back. I think one should look at these, these situations as opportunities and how to benefit. In our case, maybe that means there's more talent available that we might want to hire that are creative because their current employers cannot keep them and that would be an opportunity for us to get stronger and better talent. And in fact, um, we recently hired a few people from Japan, actually, who have moved to our offices in Hong Kong, maybe unconceivable five or six years ago. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Karen. What did you know about electrical appliances and German Paul as a brand before joining the family business in 2006 in Hong Kong? And if I could just sort of also sub, uh, add a supplementary uh, question to that, which I wasn't thinking to ask, is what were the challenges for you in joining a family business as opposed to what you have been doing previously? And how did you sort of manage to overcome those challenges? Um, I have zero experience in electrical appliances, and I hate working in a family business. <laughs> But having said that, it's a love and hate um, relationship. I hate working for my father as he is my father, but in the company, he's also my boss. To make it more complicated, I also work with my husband and my sister. So there are four bosses in the company. It's not a good um, situation, but um, it's also um, something that I treasure because I don't get much to see my father and my husband um, before I joined the company. My father is a very business businessman. And um, I remember my childhood. I only get to see him maybe once a week on Sunday, maybe for Sunday brunch, and then he has all the things that he needs to do. So I think that's what gods give back to me, is to get to spend lots of time with my husband and my father 
and my sister as well. Um, but um, to answer the challenges question, um, I think you have to have a positive mindset. Even though I have zero, uh, zero experience in electrical appliances, but um, I'm a very passionate person myself. Um, I do things um, all through my heart. I, always, I don't think there is a, a magic, uh, there, there's no magic to get to success. And um, for me, I remember the principles. It's also from heart. H stands for hard working. I know nothing, but I work very hard. I learn as much as possible through my colleagues, through my observation, uh, through my father. My father never teach me anything, but um, I observe how he do things. Um, e stands for experience. Um, I make lots of mistakes every single day. We have a Chinese saying, Mo Chu Sak Tao Guo Ho, you're reaching the stones while you're crossing the river. That's exactly what SMEs does every single day. We don't have pool of great intelligent people, to be honest, but we all have great heart. We want to accomplish something. We have very uh, great target amount of self, the management team. Um, so learning by making mistakes is very important for us. Um, ability, A stands for ability. Um, I myself is a lifelong learner. I believe you have to have a strong ability. If you have a strong competency in you or in the company, in terms of myself, I keep learning every single day, even by observe, um, observing other people, or I put myself back to school twice after I got my master degree from New York. I come back because I know nothing about the marketing industry in Hong Kong, so I went back to college to get my second master's to learn all the marketing skills. The seven pieces is what I learned from university here, and I use this every single day. It's a um, revolving process. It never, con never stops. I keep um, fixing the seven piece every single day. So um, A is ability. Always get yourself fit. The, keep yourself, yourself or the company always in top position as much as you can. Um, R stands for uh, redo, recreate. It's a company. It's, I did not build a company. I tried to make it to the next level. Um, so I have to think. I have to create. I have to recreate every single day. Redo, recreate and um, be resourceful too. Um, my father will not ask me for help, never. But I try to be as resourceful as possible. Um, last but not least is a T. T stands for trust. Trust means you have to create a reputable brand, people that trust your brand. And um, you have to be a trustworthy person. If I promise I have to get this done, I'll try my very best to get that done. And um, teamwork, um, the company come to this stage is not just one person's glory. It's just not just my father, not myself. It's a whole team. Everyone give one small little baby step. It will go very far away. And finally, Thanksgiving. Thanks God for giving me the platform. And a thanks for whatever opportunity that is um, given to me. So that's how I get through the love and hate situation. <laughs> Thank you. Now, here's a question for Leon. Um, this is from uh, the Singapore uh, chapter. You've done work for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Hong Kong. How much does that showcase your company's capabilities? Well, so Ritz-Carlton Hong Kong, uh, working. Ritz-Carlton Hong Kong uh, being the tallest hotel in the world, gave us a lot of uh, good PR globally. Uh, but as far as uh, the actual products, it's even, it was even more interesting because we could use blown glass, and blown glass is what uh, Czech Republic and you know, Bohemia is, uh, is known for, as opposed to you know, cut crystal, which is, for example, more, more like Swarovski style. So the artistic blown glass, we were able to, uh, to do what we wanted, which is not always the case. We were able to convince the owner and the architect and the designer to really let us give us the freedom to create something special in the ballroom. So the whole ceiling of the ballroom basically became one large art piece, uh, similar for the podium, uh, the catering room, and uh, the Chinese restaurant, and many other public areas. So the answer is this was really a special project that uh, doesn't happen every, every month. 
Uh, I've just been told that, in fact, we only have five minutes left for questioning, and there are so many, I won't possibly be able to go through them. Um, but I think they will be joining us for lunch. Um, so I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to also um, chat to them over lunch. But I can, also, uh, I can probably still ask one more question. Um, and this is for both Karen and um, Leon, I think, because Yad has already touched on it earlier about, in fact, a point they all touched on was the importance of having the people talent here in Hong Kong, and that's what attracted them. Um, Yad has also explained what they do to try and attract and recruit and retain those talents. What I'd like to ask uh, Karen and uh, Leon, uh, especially the very specialized uh, techniques that they, they need, uh, is how in the light of competing demand from other sectors in the service industry, how do you find the uh, availability of people with talent here? How do you retain and where do you recruit them from? Um, for our company, we are, again, small and medium-sized company. Uh, we are fortunate to have a, 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 a brand, but compared to other larger brands, like international brands, we are not in a very uh, competitive um, situation. But what we attract them is to offer them the experience. If um, they are working with us, they actually get to touch on every single aspect. What I just um, tried to showcase early on in my slideshows, Every single thing is actually built up by our own team in-house. We never hire any consultants or agency to do anything. Even taking a photo, um, uh, a photos of our products or doing PR events or doing booth, even set up booth, we do it in-house. So um, this is a different type of experience that we can offer um, um, our um, candidates. Um, when we... Um, what we're trying to do is also we give them opportunity. We are a very flat organization. Um, we give them the, the hope that they get to be in charge one day. And in fact, it is because we are growing a lot faster compared to 20 years ago because we decided we put our focus in China. So whatever we set up in Hong Kong, we have a mindset we are going to replicate in China. And having said, in, in China, China is so big. We can have a head in Guangdong area. We can have a head in Beijing. We have a head in Shanghai. And um, they, when they come um, in the first interview, we prep them already. It's a very tough job. We have very low pay. But you get to learn lots of things. If you're interested in marketing, you're interested in business development, and if you're interested in going into China, this is the place. But you've got to know you've been working very hard and working overtime a lot of the time. But we will give you all the opportunities, the chance. I think that's what, that's how we can attract um, people in our industry. Leon? Well, uh, we surely did not find anybody who knows how to blow glass in Hong Kong. And uh, we also didn't, we didn't find uh, enough, uh, you know, product designers who have experience in designing decorative custom-made uh, lighting. But uh, what we found were people who are very flexible and talented to learn, to pick up quickly. I mean, I have uh, Lisa here, she has been with us for you know, 11 years, and uh, for example, uh, she has learned, it was to her in the beginning, she had no idea which kind of company she was joining. Uh, after a few years, uh, it's kind of uh, becoming very natural for her to sell our products. You need to have passion and you need to like what you sell, and you need to create a desire in the clients, and uh, I think uh, your presentation was very educating today, educative as to how to you know, sell products in Hong Kong and Asia. So we found such people. I myself graduated from uh, uh, Kellogg uh, HKUST uh, Executive MBA in uh, Saikun here, and I met a lot of uh, talented students, both in the normal MBA and the executive MBA. So this place really, is really full of uh, very talented, flexible people, and I think the education part of Hong Kong was very important for us to set up our global headquarters here. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is up, and we have to move on to lunch. Um, so it remains for me to thank our three speakers for their excellent presentations. And I'm sure that you've all found what they had to say to be very um, impressive and very enlightening. I think what is especially evident in their, is that in their speeches, 
was the energy, the passion, and the creativity that came through, which are obviously the main ingredients of their success. So thank you again for joining us.